What makes an effective personal brand? It is more than just professional experience. You also need the credibility and reputation to justify them. Tune in as Mike Peterson talks with Sam Winsbury on how you can utilize personal branding to increase audience awareness and ultimately grow the number of clients you serve. I want to welcome you to the Dominate Your Market podcast where we interview leaders, CEO, founders, and high-impact business development professionals to get their insights on how you can grow your business efficiently, build an amazing company, and still have a life. Today's guest is Sam Winsbury. Sam is the founder and CEO of personal branding agency, Corogo. By the age of 23, he's built 100, pers 100 personal brands by 23. Boy, you've been busy. He's built 100 personal brands by the age of 23 and scaled Corogo to a team of 16. Sam, welcome to the show. Mike, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Great to be I here. I will say a couple of things. Number one, we are now international with the podcast because I think you are the first. Am I? Awesome, I'll know. And then not, not only that, you are the first that snuck in for personal branding. I've got four people scheduled already for branding. So, oh, that's, so, that's so you are there. number, you're first. So bring the heat today. Let's go, let's go, let's go. This is, <laughs> no this is all about dominating your market. You know that, right? Right there, yeah, yeah. right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> hey, I'm glad to have you on for sure. And uh, first thing, Tell me about the naming of Corogo. Where, where did that come from? Yeah, so Corogo, it's a conversation starter, that's for sure. You wouldn't oh, believe boy, the number yeah. that, that asked the question. Um, so Corogo is a Japanese term. It comes from Japanese theater. And in Japanese theater, the Corogo are stagehands that they basically work in the background, moving all of the props, changing the set around the main act. But hmm. they wear all black or the color of the back of the set, so you don't see them. So they're doing all this work in the background to essentially make the main acts look good. And that is kind of what we want to be to our clients. We're in the background doing all sorts of things behind the scenes to give them the personal brand, to make them look good, to build their reputation in an ideal world without being noticed. That's pretty humble, right? I mean, because there's so many people out there that want to stand out in front of their companies, you know, marketers and, and strategy people, they want to stand out and puff the chest up and do all that. But you're more like collaborative and like you're not so you want to be almost like, like you said, blend in, right? Like the same background, they wear the clothes of the same background of the color. So that's a cool, that's a cool attitude. Cause I think in today's society, there's, there's so much bravado. There's so much, you know, one up in each other, right? Even on the platform of LinkedIn that I spend a lot of my time on, you know, how many followers, how many connections oh, I did this, I got that all this, this, just puffing the chest. And I think that gets old after a while. You know, I've been around for a long, I'm probably, I, I am double your age. You're probably double your age. So I've been around a long, long time. So it's uh, it's refreshing to, to have a young guy like you come on and, and be more on the humble side, right? So, but personal branding to me is massive, right? It's enormous. So, you know, when I, when I schedule you, I was super excited because Talk about what personal branding is to begin with. What, 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 what is personal branding like? So for a business leader, CEO, because that's our listeners, um, founders, even some entrepreneurs, what, what is personal branding and why is it important? Yeah. So personal branding, I think sometimes it gets a, a bad rep because people either don't understand it or there's, there's a lot of misinformation around it. And people kind of think that it's, it's putting on a front, it's putting on a bravado, but it's actually quite the opposite. It's not about forging or faking a reputation for yourself it is simply about building a reputation that's going to serve you and your business by framing the skills the expertise the experiences you have in the best way possible so it's a framing exercise not a forging exercise basically take the things that you want to be known for take the things um, take the experiences the results the expertise that you have and simply present it in the best way possible and it's important because there are hundreds and hundreds of amazing businesses out there, business owners doing brilliant work, but simply not having the businesses they deserve for it because they're not showing it enough. You know, people, people think my work will do the talking. Your work will most certainly not do the talking. You need to be out there demonstrating your expertise, showing your experience and building a reputation for yourself. Um, reputation is, is an asset. It's a tool. It's a, it's a marketing tool that everybody should be using. And, I don't see why you would leave that up to somebody else's control. 
when you can kind of take control of it yourself. So that's that for me is why it's so important. You know, it's interesting too, because when you think of, you know, all my clients are business leaders, right? That's who I work with. And, and you know, some of them have companies of 100 employees, 150 employees, some have companies of 10 employees, right? So this, so the size of company varies greatly, but it's interesting. I want you to talk about this too. So when you think of personal branding for like a founder, CEO, a lot of them were like, listen, people, nobody cares about me. You know, I'm running the company. I'm in the trenches. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to step out front. I don't want to be this, the face of my company. What would you say to a, a leader that kind of has that mentality of, of not wanting to step out in front, you know, almost as if you're not in the convincing business, but in sales, we kind of are a little bit. So yeah. what would you, what would you say to that founder who says, Sam, you know, I, come on, I'm the CEO. I don't, I don't need to worry about that stuff. What would you say to that? Yeah. So the first thing is a, a bit of a mindset shift. You're right. It's not about you. It shouldn't be all me, me, me. It should be about your audience, your customers, your clients. It's about getting them to a dream world. And it's not about positioning you as the hero of the story. It's about positioning you as the guide. It's going to help them mm. along their journey, be the person that's going to kind of take them along that process. It's not this kind of self-indulgent ego boosting activity. It's something that, that you can use to help your customers. And if you, if you think you don't or you don't need it, then you just need to look at the stats. People pay up to 13.7 times more for people that they consider to be elite industry experts Ooh. than average, you know, your average consultant. So if you, uh, if you want to charge up to 13 times the prices, which ultimately would lead to 13 times more revenue, building a personal brand will help. Brand messages get shared 561% more when they come through a personal account compared to a company account. So if you want to build brand awareness, personal branding is a great tool for it. 82% of customers trust a company when their senior management team are active on social media. So if you want to earn trust, which is going to help with things like generating new business, increasing conversion rate, supporting you in charging higher prices, build your personal brand. You simply got to look at the stats and realize that this is a practical business tool, not just a kind of self-indulgent ego boosting exercise. This is a business growth tool. That, that's incredible. You said something early on that um, selfishly I absorbed to, for myself. And it was that, <laughs> but, it, but I'm going to be very vulnerable bringing this up, by the way. So uh, I don't know if you read any of my posts and you, I don't know if you've read my book or not, but I'm a very aggressive guy, right? Yeah, I'm a very in your face, own your shit kind of guy. So I'm finding my voice every day, even on LinkedIn, right? To where, you know, I cuss and I, I talk very aggressively. And um, so what would you say to a leader like me who has a strong personality, who wants to be himself, but I do have a tendency to come across, I'll own it, by the way, own your own shit. I tell people to own their shit. I'm going to own my shit for a second here. I come across very, and my book comes across very commanding. Mm. Right, it's sort of it's it's motivational. It's 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 that ex athlete in me, right? The coach, yeah. the, a coach typically, like let's say an athletic coach, they don't give you empathy, man. They fucking <laughs> they fucking tell you to get out there and go do it, right? Well, that's how I was raised, and that's who I am. So, what would you say to a strong leader like me to kind of be like, okay, Michael, wait a minute, whoa, you, you know, how mm. how would you pivot me? Well, I, I guess you have a lot of your audience and a lot of clients that love that about you, right? I guess that's probably the reason why a lot of people do work with you. People work with you for that reason. So there's certainly an element of, of not kind of letting it go out of control. But what I definitely encourage you to do is not lose it. You don't want to lose it entirely. If there's something unique about you or something that you're really passionate about, you've got to retain that in your personal brand. It might mean that actually there's hundreds of thousands of people that look at, in your example, look at you, Mike, and go, yeah, that's not quite right for me. He's not right. He's not maybe the right person for me. But there'll be hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people going, this is exactly what I need. This is right up my street. So there's an element of kind of, you don't want to sit on the fence too much and be too vanilla. You've got to retain that core part inside of you, that passion, that um, uniqueness that you have, and make sure that comes through in your content. You've just got to be very careful that you're not alienating all of your audience if you're not alienating all of your audience then you're absolutely fine it's okay to alienate some of them or even a lot of people as long as you've got that core group of people there that really buy into it and love that about you lean on it use it to your advantage 
But you said something that was interesting too, that, that when you think of brand messaging, it's, it's, for, it's for your ideal client or customer, right? It's for them. Mm. So talk about that a little bit where, because I, I think a lot of leaders would say, I don't want to make it about me. You know, they misconstrue what personal branding really is. So talk about that a little bit where, where you could shift their mindset. So let's say you talk to, you know, a 55-year-old male and mm. he's run his company for 20 years and it's successful, but he wants it to, to go more. And he's never been in front of his company. I mean, you, you can't even find this guy on his website, on the website, right? You can't even see them. <laughs> what would you say to them in the sense of like, um, they've never done it before. They're maybe the older generation. Um, what would you say to them as far as like, this is how important it is. And this is why you should do this. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at the stats, it's, you know, if you want to build trust, if you want to grow brand awareness, if you want to charge premiums, if you want to get more clients, even down to things like if you want to attract the best talent to your business, mm. if you want to future proof your career, vital for all of those things. And if you want to do that without making it about you, the place to start is with your audience. So for anyone in this position who kind of wants to build their personal brand, but doesn't want to make it about them, or maybe they see the benefits, but they're, they're so scared it's going to be all about them. What I'd encourage them to do right at the start is think about, right, who is the audience I'm trying to help? Who are these people? And what is the dream world that they want to live in? Or what mm. I call the utopia. What's the utopia that they want to create? This dream place that, you know, if they could design their perfect world, what would it look like? Get really, really clear on what that world is, what that utopia is, and who you're looking to help. And then your sole purpose, your kind of whole function as a personal brand is to guide people from where they are now in the current state, where they have pains, problems, um, fears, frustrations, and to guide them to this dream state where you know, everything is as good as it can be. Okay? And all you've got to really do once you've got those two things is work out, right, if there was a guide, if I could create a, a metaphorical guide to, to take my audience from where they are now to this end utopia, what kind of things would they be an expert in? What sort of personality traits would they have? What sort of topics would they talk about? How would they come across? Hmm. When you answer these questions, you essentially define the kind of reputation that you need to build in order to be that guide, in order to help people along that journey. And just by doing that, by taking the focus off you and making it more on how do I help people get from A to B, your personal brand becomes less about you and more about the bigger mission. That's phenomenal. That's, that's awesome. Now, now, what about this? Uh, my mind's going crazy right now. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of it's for selfish reasons, by the way, because I got you on. Um, so um, w when you think of, I totally, believe, I totally agree with you. Think of the client. What's their, what's their dreams? What's their goals? What's their vision? But if you still, you know, personal branding, some of it, in my opinion, is being authentic. Mm. And, be, being, and that, that word is thrown around and it's it almost is a fluff word now. But I struggle with that because, again, I'm going to, I'm going to say this about my own and hopefully listeners will, will understand this, but I'm so strong and so commanding. And so just like, here's what you got to do. Here's what you got to do. Right. That, and it just oozes out of me that, that to be authentic for me, I don't think I can shut that down, but I think there's a fine line of what you just said, which is really, it's about them. What's their goals? What's their dreams? So again, you know, taking a strong personality leader and trying to find that balance, I think is, is I, even for me, it almost sounds daunting. I mean, nothing's too daunting for me. I get after it, but it yeah. still sounds really interesting. So what about that? This whole idea of like personal branding, authenticity, be yourself. Don't be like everybody else. Don't be corporate, all of that. What would you say that fine line of authentic, but still you're there to serve your ideal customers? Yeah, there's, there's one very simple question that we can use to join these two things together. And it's, I'll give a little bit more context to this, but the question is, which of these things do I embody most? So if we take this utopia and the guide that, that we're essentially using to frame our reputation, let's use you as the example. You know, your audience want to dominate their market, right? Let's just say their utopia is a world where they dominate their market. They're the best in the business. They're landing customers, landing clients a healthy, profitable business. That's the utopia they're looking to create. So if we think about the kind of guide that's going to help them get there from this position where 
you know, they're not really sure maybe what their, what their niche is. They're not sure how to land clients. They're not sure how to service them. They're not sure how to promote themselves. If we had a guide that was going to take them from that position to their dream utopia, they would probably need to be, well, an expert on sales, probably an expert on um, dominating their industry, on positioning, on niching down. They'd need to be an expert in all of these things. They'd also need to have a certain number of personality traits. So they probably need to be quite motivating. So that's, it's not an easy thing to do, right? Dominating your market is not an easy thing. Mm -mm. So this guide would need to be motivating. They'd need to be empowering. They'd need to be probably a little bit empathetic, but also they'd need to be like real. They've got to be practical. Like this is hard, get on with it. So then it becomes a question for you of, right, which of these traits do I embody most? For you, it's almost having that, it's being that sports coach, go get a, make it happen, own your shit, right? You embody that most. So those are the kind of traits that you lean on a lot more in your personal brand. And it's still about your audience because you're helping them get from their position to their dream utopia, but it still stays authentic to you because you're, you're not faking any personality traits or faking expertise right. that you don't have. You're honing in on the ones that you really do have and you, the things that you really do know. Well, you know what's interesting when I think about that too is when you think of like even some of the best-selling books of all time, mm -hmm. the titles are very aggressive, right? They're mm -hmm. in your face. They're aggressive. They're not fluffy. Um, God, I wish I had this one, this one book, um, this example, this one book that it might be Think and Grow Rich even, but I don't think it's that one. But it's it's an old book that had this just horrible first title. It was it was really what the book was about, though. You know, oh, grow your business or whatever it was. And then it went out, it flopped, and then they did nothing to the book, but changed the title to a little bit more of an aggressive, just here's the deal, and it blew up, absolutely blew up, right? So that kind of makes me think of that feeling of like, uh, don't sugarcoat it. Um, I think people nowadays, I feel like, you know, uh, we live in this instant gratification world, three to five seconds, get somebody's attention, grab it and see what you can do with it. Um, so I, I think because of that, people don't want to feel you're fluffing around. You're not bullshitting around. You're not beating around the bush. Just get to it. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think, but it's not that approach. And I'm sure I don't, I don't, I want you to do more talking than I'm doing here, but I think that approach is not for everybody. And I think there's still a lot of people that are more empathetic and softer and, you know, sympathetic and all of that. So that's interesting. I, I mean, I would be, I'd like to hear you talk just a little bit about that. I mean, where, I think people do want real now. They they do want that sort of in your face because empathy mm. can only take you so far. I think it's a powerful social trait for sure. But I think if you're like, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Well, let's get, like you said, let's get on with it. Come on. Let's get real, right? Yeah, I think it definitely depends on the audience. It depends on who they are, what they're looking to achieve. Uh, even you know, for some things, you probably want a little bit more empathy than others. You know, if it's a relationship coach, they probably need to be a little bit more empathetic than than a business coach, right? So there's there's definitely nuance to it. It's not a hard and fast rule. I think it really does depend on what they're looking to achieve, who you're helping here, who the audience is. But absolutely, we've definitely seen a shift over the last, it's, it's kind of swung one way than the other. You know, I think in the early, early 2000s, maybe up to 2010, um, whilst I was far too young to be in business, it was kind of, you know, it was quite real. It was quite practical. And then we went through this phase where everything became so fluffy almost um, and dare I say a little bit soft. And now it seems to be kind of swinging back in the other way, in the other direction where people are getting a bit more real about, you know, what it takes. So, um, yeah, it really depends on, on your audience, but it's important to find, find that out for yourself because there won't be one hard and fast rule for everybody. Well, I think you just said a critical thing, depending on really the niche you're in, mm. right? You know, like, you know, a family therapist, well, gosh, dang, you better be empathetic, right? So anything, you know, psychological, I get it. But, and, and I guess maybe me falling into business development and business growth fits my personality, which is a perfect fit. So I can yeah. be more aggressive. I can meet, be more commanding, right? But I think, so, so you make a very good point that I think a lot of people, they've got to really understand the niche they're in, the language they need to speak, to resonate with their ideal clients and prospects, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that comes from understanding them as people. You have to understand who you're going after first. This is literally the root cause of so many personal branding problems, so many positioning problems, is just not understanding your audience well enough. People say, oh, 
I don't know what to post. I don't know what content I should talk about. I don't know how to position myself. Well, you don't understand the kind of reputation you need and you don't understand the kind of reputation you need because you don't know the utopia you're looking to create. And you don't know that because you don't know who you're helping. It always comes mm. back to who you're helping, who the audience is. And the better you understand them, the easier everything else is. Literally, like the, the, the better you understand the audience, if you understand them well enough, your content will write itself. Your positioning will sort itself out. Everything, your sales process will create itself. It becomes so, so simple when you understand your audience. You know, it's interesting. So you get inside their mind on a very deep level. And you know, when you That's think of you an actor and actress, what do they do when they, they get ready for a part, a role? Mm. And some of them have been interviewed. Well, I think even um, Heath Ledger in Batman, right? And the unfortunate situation, you know, ending of his life. He, he got very dark, very, very dark, right? He went to a dark place to, and he talked about that. And that's, that's so powerful to think that he got so into character that it literally affected his, his real life in reality. So it's almost kind of like what you're saying there, not to that point, but to the point of get so deep into your ideal client or customer's mind that you almost become them, right? Yeah, you've got to know them inside out. There is a saying as well that you're always best positioned to help the person you once were. So if your target audience is a previous version of yourself, then that's super powerful. You know, if you're helping someone that's in your position from five years ago and you've kind of been through the problems, the experiences that they're going through now, then you relate to them a lot more. You understand where they are and you understand how to get out of it because you've done it. So if you are the person or you're helping the person you once were, that's extremely powerful as well. Okay, so, so I should have asked this question, question at the very beginning, but I'm going to ask it now. So you're 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 a young man. Yeah. How what what got you to have this passion and love and interest for personal branding at such a young age? I I mean I should ask at the beginning, but I'm asking now because I think I want people to hear it from you. What 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 got you into that? Because I mean you are a young man. Yeah. So 23 now. I've always been quite entrepreneurial. Even since you know when I was at school, I was writing psychology blogs just because I was interested in psychology, and that was kind of you know, a psychology blog, it wasn't my, it wasn't a business, but it taught me a lot of business lessons. It taught me how to grow an audience, how to write blogs, how to set up a website, all of these sorts of things. And fell in love with marketing from there whilst I was kind of continued studying at college, university. Um, I was basically looking to get all sorts of different freelance marketing projects, just to kind of get, get a bit of experience, help my career out. But what I found is that I found it very, very difficult to land these projects. I was going to networking events. I was sending messages and everyone was like, who the hell is this 19 year old kid? <laughs> and, and who can blame them? You know, I was yeah. just a 19 year old kid at the time. So what I decided to do instead was just start sharing the things that I did know, share the things that I was learning on social media, mainly on LinkedIn at the time to kind of show people that, you know, yes, I'm young, but I do know a fair bit i know i know more than most i don't know everything but i do know a fair bit and what actually started happening from that was instead of having people reach out to me for the marketing services that i wanted to provide people just started happening to to reach out to me saying can you help me build my linkedin profile as well i've seen you posting mm -hmm. can you help me with content so i almost stumbled into it helping other people build their linkedin profiles did that for a couple of years coached consulted and then when I left college in 2020, I built out the agency. So I was 21 at the time. Wow. So I built out the agency from there, um, which was much more focused on kind of wide scale personal branding done for you rather than coaching consulting. We actually do the work for our clients now. Um, yeah, I started building it late 2021 and then it got out of hand and here we are. <laughs> that, that, that's incredible. I, I love that story about it because just you are on the younger side, but yet you're you're almost like an old soul kind of in a way that you, you've got you're this young man, but yet you've I mean, you're proving yourself. Obviously, you built a team of 16 in your company. So it's I mean, the proof's in the pudding. Right. You would if you know, so I think that's very, very cool. Now, let me ask you this. So if, if there's a, if a business leader is listening right now. So and he says, well, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll bite on this. I'll bite. What what should they think about first? Like, what's like a 
you know, if you've got some, again, let's go back to the 50 year old person, right? And they're, you know, they've been in their company 20 years, they've, they're not even on their website, you can't even find them anywhere. What would you say to them as like a first step to just like, give it a shot? Okay, so some, I'd, I'd start with what the goal is. So you've got to be clear on why you're actually doing this. If you're not clear on what you actually want to get out of this it's very, very difficult to start. Once you've got that goal, work out who you're looking to help and what their utopia is. Get really, really clear on that. And then you can start to work backwards from there. Once you know the audience, once you know the utopia, you can think, right, I can work out the kind of reputation that I want to build based on what this guide would look like and what I kind of most represent um, from that guide. But in terms of like actionable steps, how you translate this into real results, content is going to be, for most people at the start, the biggest engine of your personal brand. It's going to be the thing that amplifies the positioning that you're looking to take. So, you know, later down the line, you can focus on doing PR, writing books, getting on stage, doing podcast appearances. But for the first month or two, for the first few months, just focus on building out a body of content on social media. It's the easiest way to get in front of your audience. It's low hanging fruit. Right, so if you want to start seeing traction, start seeing results, start sharing content that helps your audience go from where they are now to that utopia create value-based content that they can use to learn from and see results from. And you'll start building up an audience that know who you are, like you, trust you, and see you as an expert in your space. Okay, so I'm going to be devil's advocate and I'm going to, I'm going to push you a little bit because I'm, and I know you can take it. So <laughs> you, you got a person that says, I'm too busy for this. I write something on LinkedIn. I'm not even on LinkedIn. So what would you say to them? You know, and Because I, I think of probably 80% of my clients who are very, very busy and they're successful, but they do have a growth mindset or I wouldn't be working with them. Uh, mm. But but if I told them, you know, hey, start creating content, they'd be like, I, I don't have any time. What do you mean create content? I mean, I'm, I'm running my company. So is there, what would be the strategy there? Would it be some a company like yours maybe without promoting you yet? We'll promote <laughs> you at the end, but but what, what, would, what, what would they do if like the pushback would be so strong where, because I, I, I can think of, six or seven of my CEO clients right now that if I probably said that, and I know it's really the right thing, they mm. would be like whoosh, complete pushback. What, what do you say to that? I mean, cause you've got to be um, as a service provider, like you and me, we've got to be malleable a bit, little bit like, okay, all right. I understand, sir. What would yeah. you say to that? Where they're just like, no, no, I'm no, I'm not even on LinkedIn. What would you say to that? Yeah. So the first thing I do, if I was feeling really cheeky is I challenge them a little bit. I say, hang on, you know, this is right for your business, but you don't have time to do it. It's then a question of priority rather than time. You know, we all have, we all have time to do anything. It's just what we prioritize. Right? True. I somehow make time for the gym every day because it's priority. Right? So if I was feeling really cheeky, I might, I might push back on that a little bit. But if it was mm -hmm. absolutely no, I don't have the time. A few things that you can do to basically do it in as little time as possible. The first thing is to batch create. So sure you might not have half an hour to sit down and create content every day but could you dedicate one hour a month and then you might manage to get two or three pieces of content each week out of that hmm. if you just sat down blocked out all distractions for one hour a month and batch created you know a post a week or two posts a week three posts per week for the month you could probably quite feasibly get it all done in that hour if you understand your audience well enough it should be relatively easy and don't try and make it absolutely perfect at the start. You know, if time is an issue for you, just get the ball rolling. Okay, so first one is time batch. Second thing is repurpose. So a lot of content is basically already exists in people's lives. I'm sure they all have pitch decks potentially. I'm sure they all do maybe sales calls or they have internal meetings. There is bucket loads of content in that or even a podcast recording like this. Yep. You know, bucket loads of content in that that simply needs to be reshaped and reformatted for social so i mean let's take this podcast you could turn it into there's probably 50 different clips you could get oh, from yeah. this for you sure. could transcribe this whole thing into a blog you could transcribe each one of the clips into a text post you could cut those text posts down and turn it into tweets there's so many ways so many different um ways to produce a lot of content from one form of long uh, one piece of long form content so take the content that you're already producing without knowing it conversations that you're having, sales calls that you're doing, um, IP that you have, blogs that maybe you've written in the past and just repurpose them. 
use the same information, but present it in a new and creative way. That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant right there. And really at that point too, um, God forbid I say this, but you know, maybe you, you would have a, an assistant in your company that would really get into your LinkedIn and, po and, and post it, right? You know what I mean? Like if they're like, I don't, I, I don't I blog, I've never even used, they, they might say, I, no, I don't know LinkedIn. At that point, it is your content or the content of the company and then you post it. So it's still authentic, but then you, 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 you delegate somebody on your team uh, you know, that would just say, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll break it down in snippets. We'll put it on. At least that's happening for your personal brand as opposed to zero. Yeah, it's something, right? Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about, since the name of my book is Dominate Your Market, the name of the podcast is Dominate Your Market. So there's branding. Hopefully you, you think that's good branding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but because Dominate Your Market, so when you think of personal branding, to dominate a market with personal branding, right? So I think that's almost like up leveling, right? That's like, okay, let's let's get some positioning, but how could you do something with your with a personal brand or branding that could dominate a market? Like give like a couple of tips on that where it's so you said some really good stuff, but like if you know some of my some of my listeners really are kind of jumping on my my tribe of dominate, what would that be like? Yeah. So one thing you can do is be known by a very specific group of people for a very specific thing. If you become a generalist, it's very, very difficult to dominate a market. There are a lot of generalists out there. And really, if you're a generalist, you, you're basically competing in a race to the bottom on price. You know, it's There's very little to distinguish you from anybody else. So really the only distinguishing factor is the price. So don't be a generalist, be really specific. Get a specific result for a specific group of people is one way. If you wanna go a step further, you can actually do what's called creating a new niche or market or category. I can't take complete credit to this. I've got to give a massive shout to, I don't know if you've heard of Category Pirates. Um, no. Eddie Yoon, Chris, oh, you've got to try and get one of these guys on the podcast. Um, Eddie Yoon, yeah. Christopher Lockhead, uh, Nicholas Cole, I think is the- Maybe you can uh, make an introduction. Come on now, come on. I don't don't know them personally. But, but you I don't know, try. okay, dang uh, it. <laughs> but they, uh, they have this amazing thing called category design, category creation which essentially involves creating a new niche. So rather than just picking a niche, which probably already exists, one of the best things you can do is create a completely new category, create mm. a new version of an industry or a market. And by definition, if you create that, you become the first person in it, the only person in it. You are the only person to do this specific thing, which means you have no competitors. And that That's is a way- incredible. Dominant. When you imagine what it would do for your business if you didn't have to compete on price, you had no competitors, so you could charge what you want. There was no alternative for you, so you know sales calls would be a lot easier. You probably wouldn't have clients leaving you to go to a competitor; they'd be staying with you. That's what happens when you create a category and you and you own that category. By definition, you you dominate it. You know, it's interesting because because I'll, I'll bring it circle back. And I think a lot of listeners would, would, would appreciate this or enjoy it, but I'll still go back to, to my brand. That's always, it's evolving every day. And mm. um, I've, for the last 25 years, I've worked with men, right? I just, that alpha mentality, that ex-athlete mentality. I've, uh, so in a previous life, I was a private fitness trainer, fitness, right? And mm. I was training these male CEOs in their home. And I just got one after the other. And I was getting referred to all of them. So I was in this circle of, high powered men that were, but they were physically broken, mentally broken, their relationships were divorced, right? So they were really broken in many ways, but they were alphas, successful men, right? So, and I loved it, I loved it. And then now it's kind of funny, my career is full circle come around from not fitness anymore, although I do it for myself, but I'm back to working with mostly the men again. And it's just preference, there's no, I mean, I, it's not like, oh, I don't want to work with women. It just, it's who I click with. So yeah. I almost thought about this where typically my client is above 50, like me, right? I'm 50. I turned 59 two months ago. So, so. You're looking good for 59. I appreciate that. But so, so really it's, it's, I thought, God, could I go that tight? Could I go, you know, business, male business leaders over 50, yeah. you know, that, I, I don't, and I'm, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but it would be, it would be getting people to think that way 
And I did, I've thought many times, sh- should I do it? Should I go all the way and just do that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, what you did as a, as a fitness coach, whether this was intentional or not, is absolutely genius. You know, fitness coaches, that's, that's a very difficult market to dominate. You're competing with thousands and thousands of people, but being a fitness coach for broken alphas in their own home, that's a new category that nobody else is doing. Oh, I owned it. Yeah, I owned it. So yeah. you, you created and owned that category and you yeah. were probably known as the guy. So, you know, when the first broken alpha entrepreneur that you help with their fitness in their own home goes, oh my God, this is amazing. They're going to tell their friend about you and then right. they're going to tell their friend and so on. Right. But if you were just fitness coach, then they could refer any old fitness coach. It's very difficult to, to differentiate. But you were known for that one specific thing and you dominated it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and, but I think in a, in a company, um, and we could go off in so many tangents with this, but I really like your mindset I, and your knowledge at such a young age is very impressive. So if you get a company that is like a real old school, you know, not brick and mortar, but just you, if I told a CEO like that, oh, let's create a new category, he'd be like, no, 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 we, 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 we do this. This is what we do. Right. So and that's in that standpoint. And I get it, by the way. And I would not try to push too hard on that because they're hiring me to help them grow their revenues for whatever this is. Mm. So in that situation, it would be very difficult to say, you know, hey, John, let's let's do something completely new there. It's like, no, 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 we we offer this. But there's got to be a way to. So so can you can you I'm I'm digging in deep with you right, right now. But is there a way to in that situation where they sell a widget? And it's literally, we produce this widget and this yeah. is what we do. Say, no, we're, we're not going to veer off and do something new. What would you do in that situation? Yeah, so it doesn't have to be like a complete revolution. It can be small, subtle changes. And that change could be on simply on the audience. So they could just focus on one audience. Um, they could do it process-based. So they could just focus on like, the way they deliver it. it could be different. Oh. Oh, yeah. They don't have to completely reinvent the widget that they're offering, but it could be the way that they approach it. The, the processes that they have in the background, the way they interact with the customer or the client it could be based on location. It could simply be in the way that they frame it, calling it something different and having very minor changes in any of those things is an easy way to essentially create a new category without completely reinventing the wheel and changing the business. So if they are stuck in their ways, just yeah, make subtle changes. It doesn't have to be huge. That is freaking brilliant. That is brilliant right there. I love that. Where it's just talk about your unique process. Talk mm. about something that makes you different than everybody else, right? It yeah. was so it was so funny. There's a story. Um, do you know Jay Abraham or heard heard the name Jay Abraham? Yeah, I like the name. The Godfather of of marketing, right? And his yeah. book, uh, getting everything out of what you've got, something like that. It's a great book. It's like a Bible, right? But he talked about, and don't quote me on what beer brand it was, but it was, and this is a great story, by the way, for anybody to listen to. Um, I think it was Schlitz, by the way, Schlitz beer here in America or whatever. But so so this, this business person, I don't think it was Jay Abraham, went into the company and they were number two in the market or something like that behind like Budweiser or something. And this, this business person walked through the plant and, and the owner was like, we do this, we do this, we do this and all this stuff. And then, but and the, this business development person keyed in on this, the process of how they make the beer. Mm. This is, I got goosebumps on this. And so <laughs> the guy says, well, we, we sterilize the water. We do this, we do that. Well, everybody does it. And he, and he just, uh, the, the CEO of the company flippantly said, everybody does it. He goes, I've never heard it. Yeah. I, I've never heard that story. Well, they, took that, put it out on the forefront. God, I got goosebumps on this. They put it out, they put it out on the forefront. Yeah. And, and truly, every company, that's how they made the beer. They steal the water. They did this. They did this. But that, that process was never publicly stated yeah. or positioned that way. And it exploded this business. They, they dominated. There we go. They yeah. dominated because they, they talk about a process that the CEO said, oh, well, we all make our beer like that. And yet, so isn't that interesting? So you talk about the word process. That's that's one that any CEO or business leader listening to this podcast right there. 
How could yeah. we position our process not, you know, in a way that is just superior than everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Or even just different. Just different is okay. If everybody is doing, you know, talking, if we talk on a coaching business, if everybody is doing do it yourself, can you do done with you? If everybody's doing done with you, why don't you do done for you? If everyone's doing done for you, do it with them. You know, even very subtle changes like that make a massive difference. This is one of the first podcasts. I think I've shot, we're a new podcast, but we're going hundred miles an hour. I think this is like my 16th recording in the last month. Um, this one's got me, my mind is going. So you've done a very good job of, of it's almost selfish. I feel kind of selfish, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope that everybody listening takes a lot from this, right? That, but you got me thinking of my own stuff to the point of like processes and this and differentiate. It's very, very cool. So Sam, I want to thank you so much for your time, but key here, how can people get a hold of you? Give us your website, give us anything you can. Um, you don't have a book yet, do you? No, I don't have a book yet. Dude, get it. Take Soon. that, take that brain and dump that on a book. Cause boy, I'll tell you, even at your stage of life where you're at, you've got a lot of good things to say. So how can people find out about you? Yeah. So if you want to find all of the blogs that will be turned into my book in the future, um, go to samwinsbury.co.uk. I write every single week on there around oh, wow. personal and agency building. If you want to check out Corogo and more of what we do, head to corogo.co.uk. Um, and I'm frequently active on LinkedIn, Sam G. Winsbury on there. And the Krogo is K-U-R-O-G-O. Yeah. So it's www.kurogo.co.uk. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And that'll be in the show notes on the website and all that stuff too as well. But Sam, thank you so much for your time. I know it's it's evening over there in the UK, so I do appreciate this. But uh, this was awesome, man. Thank you. I loved it. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you having me on. You've just listened to the Dominate Your Market podcast with CEO business consultant and author, Michael Peterson. Growth-minded CEOs hire Michael to explode their revenues, build an amazing company, and create a transformational mindset that encapsulates growth, success, and ultimately, happiness. His book, Dominate Your Market, is creating quite a stir in the marketplace. Go to dominateyourmarketbook.com and get your first chapter free.